Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Keep up with all of this, of course, at tarpley.net and by Surviving the Cataclysm, second edition. If you want to understand what's going on with derivatives, it's all in there. And it's uncanny how much of this is um, essentially uh, forecast uh, down to some very granular detail. So uh, the G20, uh, the attempt of the U.S., to make the world safe for derivatives hedge funds and to uh, maintain these as uh, immune to taxation, that uh, the uh, entire financial sector worldwide should be immune to taxation, just like the nobility of the French old regime before 1789. They don't want to be taxed. And all those deficits that Time magazine is pointing to generally correspond to the fact that financial transactions are not taxed and that the Corporate income tax is shot through with so many holes that Goldman Sachs can get away with paying 3% tax on their profits. And, of course, they're second to ExxonMobil that got away paying zero corporate income tax, if you can believe that. Uh, and in those same days, the uh, Republican reactionaries have blocked unemployment benefits for 1.3 million hardworking Americans, to say nothing of the 99-week uh, victims uh, for whom there was never anything on the table to begin with. So there's your hope and change, right? There's your rich, elitist Wall Street puppet in the White House. Uh, doesn't care about any of that. He's concerned about derivatives, right? Economic policy made by Geithner and Bernanke and Sheila Baer. So we got to talk about McChrystal. Now, we have a whole article about this. The 18th Brumaire of Dave Petraeus, right? That's the coup d'etat by Napoleon in 1799. What happens when a weak civilian government, bankrupt, uh, turns to a charismatic military figure and hopes that the charismatic military figure can save them by winning some foreign victories? He sometimes does. He wins the foreign victories, but then he comes back and pulls a coup and gets rid of those weak civilian figures that have put him into power. That's the story of Napoleon. You can read about this on tarpley.net. Napoleon, Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon, coming back, and Ludendorff Hindenburg, Hindenburg Ludendorff in World War I, when they got the power uh, at their headquarters and everybody in Berlin, be it the parliament, the prime minister, or the emperor, all became less important. And before too many years, you had Hindenburg running Germany as president under a dictatorship, uh, emergency rule. Are we headed towards that? Well, the uh, story with uh, this silly magazine, this marginal uh, mag counterculture magazine, Rolling Stone. Uh, what do you have there? You got a, a you know scuttlebutt, barrack room griping by Petraeus, but very little by him, mainly by his staff. So they think Obama's unprepared. They think General Jones is a clown. They think Holbrook is a wounded animal. What's the big deal? Um, you know, uh, verba volant, right? Words fly away. Who, who cares? The dogs bark. The caravan moves on. A strong figure would say, yeah, fine. I'm willing to put up with this if you win some victories. That's what Lincoln would have said. I'll hold your coat. Win me some victories. And of course, he can't. Um, Obama can't do that because he's so weak. Obama was obviously hysterical this week that after the concentrated barrage on him for fecklessness, lack of executive ability, impotence, detachment, uh, just a failure uh, on this oil spill issue. He was so afraid that if he let uh, McChrystal get away with a little bit of sniping in this silly marginal m paper, uh, that his entire regime would collapse. Uh, and uh, he's also obviously concerned about the fact that the, uh, the Afghan war is being lost, as the London Economist puts on their cover this week. The, the Afghan war is lost. It is a lost cause. I guess that made it easier to get rid of McChrystal. Uh, but it would have been better to fire McChrystal over losing the war rather than les majeste against the perfect master, the savior. The other thing, of course, you get out of these interesting comments is what McChrystal says is what the officer corps thinks. The officer corps hates Obama, clear. Or the officer corps holds Obama in contempt. This was, you could see this a mile away. Get yourself a copy of Barack H. Obama, the unauthorized biography by me, and you will see towards the end that it's clear that Obama will never be accepted, right? Obama with 
Bill Ayers, the weatherman terrorist, Bernadine Dorn, the weatherman, the weather girl uh, with Jeremiah Wright, the incendiary racist provocateur. How is he ever going to be acceptable to the officer corps? Uh, and he never has been. So there's all that. There's mainly the issue of the deadline to get out. But uh, this is what what uh, McChrystal is essentially articulating is what they all think. Now, the, the complicating factor is that of the Obama appointees, we have the former General Eikenberry, who is there in Kabul. He hates Karzai. Karzai hates him. Then we have Holbrook, who's an, uh, a Wall Street character put in there by Hillary Clinton. Holbrook can't get along with Eikenberry. Holbrook can't get along with uh, McChrystal. Holbrook can't get along with the U.S. ambassador to Pakistan. Uh, and uh, Jones, a uh, notice uh, in this press conference when the firing of McChrystal was announced, who did you have? You had five personalities of the regime going from left to right. Mullen, Biden, Obama, Petraeus, Gates. Yeah, who's missing? General Jones. And of course, Gen the, the head of the National Security Council, the clown, in this case, we had Biden bite me, but we didn't have the clown, Jones. The National Security Council director is supposed to avoid this kind of fratricidal clique warfare. And he couldn't do it. So where is Jones? Is he going to be fired too? The whole thing is in disarray. And you heard Obama plead in his uh, speech there for uh, uh, peace among his own staff. Well, you know, you got to fire some people. And uh, he's fired one person, I guess this is now, but but not on any policy distinction, but just on this, these silly uh, pieces of, of scuttlebutt and gossip and rumors that, that are reported in, in this magazine. So uh, Obama is a feckless weakling. And the thing about weakness is, if you're so convinced that you're weak and so freaked out that you're going to be exposed as weak, you do crazy things. And what Obama has now done is to take the leader of the neocon faction, the symbolic point of regroupment for the neocons, is Petraeus. Petraeus is Mr. Neocon, the head of the faction. Bush is gone, Cheney's gone. Who is the top neocon? Petraeus. Notice the neocons themselves don't run for president, right? They use characters like Bush and Cheney. In this case, they're, they're going to use, they are using Petraeus, right? He's got William Crystal, he's got Max Boot. Frank Gaffney, the Kagans, the American Enterprise Institute, Charles Krauthammer, they all love Petraeus. Petraeus is the neocon restoration personified, the restoration of the neocon warmonger clique and all of their disgusting warmonger rhetoric, cut and run, don't cut and run, stay the course, all this stuff. Petraeus is the ticket for the whole new generation of neocons. Uh, to get back into power, not maybe not the, the Wolfowitzes and the Fifes that are a little bit chewed up, but maybe even them, ultimately. So what Obama has now done is to make his own principal rival great. We've talked in the past about how Petraeus is far more effective than any Republican candidate. The imbecile Palin, the clown Huckabee, the non-entities Paulenti, Jindal, the southern regional candidates Dement or Dement and uh, Haley Barber, who almost got indicted as he was leaving Washington. Um, none, of this, none of this can be taken seriously. But Petraeus Romney or Petraeus Mitch Daniels, that can be taken seriously. And that seems to be where the ruling class is going. Here's how the conflict comes out. The deadline for the troop withdrawal will become the issue. Obama says, I want to start getting people out of there in July of 2011, the Iowa straw poll, the primary campaign, the election campaign. If you want to energize the Democratic base, you've got to say, yes, I have ended the Iraq war. I've ended the Afghan war. That would be Obama's hope of getting reelected. But Petraeus is going to be there to say, no, no, we've got to fight on. We don't want to cut and run. You're wasting the fruits of victory. You're betraying the people who have given their lives and on and on. Notice also the war is lost. Petraeus is now being handed a lost war and it's unwinnable. It's hopeless. Ask the Soviets, ask some very formidable military people over the years. Can't be done. So Petraeus can't just sit there and accept the responsibility for a lost war. He's got to turn around and blame Obama. And he'll say, I'm going to resign my commission, come home and take this to the voters in the primary campaign, because there is no substitute for victory, will say the faker neocon Petraeus. And that's where we're headed. Congratulations, Sparky. The neocons are celebrating tonight and you have weakened yourself. We'll be back in a minute.